Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, th thank you so much for coming. I hope everyone finds a, a, a seat where you're welcome to steal chairs from proximate places. Um, I am Bruce Grant from Anthropology here at, at uh, NYU. I'm really delighted to introduce our uh, speaker today, the wonderful Kate Brown, uh, who is currently uh, among the historians in the STS, the Science, Technology, and Society program at MIT. So came down to us today from Boston. Um, I, I think if we have a healthy crowd in the room today, it's because uh, a lot of people uh, know Kate's work and have come to Kate's work from lots of different angles and found really um, first class thinking, wonderful, original, um, careful thinking at almost every turn, which has at least been my own experience. Um, some of us are a bit um, slow on the uptake and were wounded to understand just how prolific she's been when I already was impressed with her first two books, which are the ones that I know best. Um, many of us who were interested in nationality politics in the former Soviet Union started with uh, her wonderful 2004 book, I believe it was, um, a biography of no place uh, from, from, uh, from ethnic borderland to Soviet heartland. For myself, reading it as someone at the time who didn't know much about Ukraine, I was incredibly compelled by this. You know, rather than someone just telling a straight story of what was available in a positive sense in the archives and what that did or didn't say, she had this really wonderful take from the very beginning of just asking why it was that this this very evident place, though a very robust place with a booming economy and lots of people and lots of things to say, was somehow always understood as being on the periphery of other people's power structures and therefore somehow too hard to place. And well, you might not describe your book in this way. I remember reading it thinking, <laughs> wow, she, she did all this incredible field work that took her to different archives to show the ways in which documents and subjects that mattered a great deal in one area meant almost not nothing in the other because of the different regimes of knowledge and value that surrounded it. That here was this incredibly important part of the world that was somehow refusing easy categorization. And that um, started off uh, people like me as being among her many uh, faithful readers. Uh, I think probably more people in the room today know her from uh, the next book that followed, which was the uh, even more prize-winning Plutopia, no, 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 excuse me, Nuclear Families in Atomic Cities and the Great Soviet and American Plutonium Disasters. I'll just say very briefly about this, that again, something really unusual took place, which was that she told a story about, uh, about American and Soviet no, no nuclear pasts and presence as if they should be compared on the same footing. And one would think that would be kind of obvious, except that is not obvious to most people who work normally through Cold War prisms and, and so forth. It was a remarkably disarming focus that she brought to this world of science and technology. I want to say that this is just good geography when you keep thinking about place, or good is someone's just a very good historian. But strangely enough, we don't normally use those words. She has to be called a critical geographer, right? Because she actually <laughs> takes places seriously and ends up confounding the labels by which they become known. And that is one of the many things that I found thrilling in her work. Um, she's made uh, some of us feel badly about going on to write yet two more books, uh, being so productive. She's, uh, this was followed in 2015 by Dispatches from Dystopia, Histories of Places Not Yet Forgotten, uh, and of course, uh, the one that just this past spring, Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future, which is, I believe, going to inform at least some of our experience today. Um, the talk is up behind me. It's the Great Chernobyl Acceleration. Please join me in welcoming Kate Brown. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Bruce, for that really generous and insightful. I wish you, you I talked to you in 2004 and I published your biography of notebooks, but that's the best characterization I've ever heard of it. And thank you, Sasha, for setting this up and Joshua for inviting me. And uh, I want to talk today about this, my most recent book. Um, a Manual for Survival, and um, you know, when I started this project, I, I thought, you know, we know so much about Chernobyl, you hear so much about Chernobyl, people were really taken by the HBO series that played last spring, but when I started to work this story, I realized, in fact, there's so much we don't know about this accident, especially for certain, so many disputed numbers, and so I, I tried to just figure out what I could, like, you know, how many people died? 
you know, what, what was the environmental and medical impact of this accident? <coughs> so um, I did what historians do. I, I first I walked into the archive and I asked the, the archivist and, and Kiev, you know, I want the Ministry of Health records on the Chernobyl accident. And, and they laughed at me and said, you know, that was a banned topic during the Soviet period. You're not going to find anything. And I said, well, let's just look anyway. So it didn't take a great researcher. Within about three minutes, we had, I had these big bound volumes that said in plain Ukrainian the medical consequences of the Chernobyl disaster. And I sat down and started reading these documents and you know, thought to myself, I'm going to be at this for years. And, and indeed, I was. And, and what I figured out um, almost right from the start is that Chernobyl is often framed as, as, as an accident in a certain very constricted time and place. You know, the, the site is usually, and people usually, you know, is, and the Chernobyl show is a classic example of that. You know, like seconds tick down, the accident occurs, and then it plays out really the rest of the summer for a couple of months, and then story over, case closed. Um, the accident is sort of, it's geo, chrono, chronologically, it's quite constrained or, um, you know, limited. And in terms of space, it's quite limited. It's usually people, when they think of Chernobyl, they think of the Chernobyl zone. If you watch the Chernobyl show, it's just about the accident site itself. Um, and that's not in itself an accident. It's exactly how Soviet officials wanted people to think about this place. It's a, as, a, as a limited event, quite contained in space, that had a, a concluding chapter to it, that concluded quite soon, as quickly as they could get it to conclude. Um, but what I learned as I widened the scope beyond the Chernobyl zone and beyond chronologically beyond these you know, first couple of months after the accident is that that is really where the drama plays out. And then when you start to widen the scope, you learn that much of what we know about the Chernobyl event is either misleading or just plain wrong. Um, let me show you what I mean. Um, a Russian, you know, Moscow officials said, you know, We've contained the accident within the chemical zone. The, we've contained the radioactivity within the zone. But what I found is that a couple of days after the accident, <coughs> um, the officials at the Weather Bureau realized that there was a big storm front and it was heading northeast with all this radioactive fallout in it. And it was going to hit the big Russian cities, Moscow, Voronezh, and Yaroslavl. So they sent up planes, manipulated the weather, so it rained on rural Belarus in order to save urban Russia. And you can see this from this map. Um, this is the Chernobyl, it's pretty crappy quality. This is Chernobyl uh, site right here, angry red spots. The pilots let up over the city of Gomel, about a half million people, and let it rain right here in the southern Mogilev province. Um, this basically today is the second Chernobyl zone. It's almost fully depopulated, but it only became almost fully depopulated in 1999. So for uh, over a decade, people lived in terrifically hot levels of radioactivity. Um, but this second Chernobyl zone, I don't, uh, very few tourists visit it. Journalists don't go there to look and see how um, much the nature is thriving. This is sort of, you know, off everybody's radar. Um, Officially, Moscow officials said, you know, we, we, we sent doctors out and we examined 900,000 people and we found no evidence of any kind of medical impact from Chernobyl fallout contaminants, you know, among people. Um, <coughs> and, you know, the official count is, and if you go to the UN records, you still see this, 300 people were hospitalized after the accidents. These were mostly liquidators, nuclear power plant workers, firemen. Um, but what I found is that not 300 people were hospitalized after the accident, but 40,000 people in the summer after the accident from Chernobyl exposures, 11,000 of whom were kids. Um, and records show that immediately after the accident, doctors treated sick children and adults. Uh, they recorded an increase in thyroid problems, complications at birth, birth defects, and a uh, big rise in infant mortality. Children and pregnant women were especially hard hit in the first summer after the accident. But then the medical effects began to spread to other parts of the population. Um, in 1987, in contaminated regions, half of the children had enlarged thyroids, and, and so did the adults. Half of the children, um, or perinatal deaths, deaths within 28 days, doubled in 87, tripled in 1988. Um, in one county of 103 pregnancies, 
63 babies were born alive. You see these kind of numbers coming out. Um, the other uh, big question is the death toll. You know, reporters always call, what was the death toll? The official death toll, if you go, again, if you go to the UN records, it's between 35 and 54 people died from the Chernobyl accident. Um, I looked and looked and looked. Ukraine and Belarus, there's just they have, there's no official tally anywhere. Um, I'm sorry, did I say Russia and Belarus, but Ukraine does have a tally. They give 35,000 men compensation for, or 35,000 women compensation for husbands who die with Chernobyl-related illnesses. Um, that's just men who died, men who were old enough to marry, men who had documented exposures. That doesn't include anybody else who were in any possible other category. At the um, 30th anniversary, the big official event in Ukraine, the officials there said 150,000 Ukrainians had died so far from the accident. So 35,000 is probably a much closer number than 35 dead from the accident. Um, I can also see that the typical map of radiation didn't make a lot of sense. Um, what I found is that there were um, in, in relatively clean areas like this town of Chernigov, where you don't see much of a radioactive fallout there, I found this record that said that there was 200 um, wool workers in a factory there who had got liquidator status. Now, liquidators were people who had documented exposures for cleaning up the Chernobyl accident. And I just I couldn't figure out, like, how did that happen in a relatively clean town 50 miles away? How did these women wool workers get such an exposure to become liquidators? So I kept working in the archives, and I finally got in a car, and I drove up to the factory, and I talked to the managers, and they said, yeah, in 1986, we had a, a problem with radioactive wool, and uh, we had some officials come from Moscow, and we changed our process, and problem solved. I wasn't so sure about that story, because I had seen these records in the archive that I could see that the problem went on. So I, I asked to go down on the line, and on the line, I met um, women who were the, the wool workers, and, and there were 10 left who were on my list of 200 liquidators. And I said, where's everybody else? And they said, oh, well, they've either died or they've been invalided out on pensions. And these women had a much more interesting story to tell. Um, they talked about how they were, you know, their job was to sort this dirty wool. And so every day they would pick up these big bales of wool many times a day, and each time they did, the bales of wool measured 3.2 milliroton an hour. That's like picking up an x-ray machine many times a day while it's turned on. And um, th they were pretty interesting in the sense that they didn't have even a high school education, but I was impressed by their knowledge of radiobiology. Um, they pointed to different parts of their body that were diseased or ached, and they could tell me which radioactive isotopes landed in those organs or those, uh, that material because they knew how radioactive isotopes filtered into bodies. Um, they, they said, do you know where the radioactive wastewater? They were like, we can get this wool pretty clean by washing it, but radioactivity doesn't just go away. They're like, do you know where the radioactive wastewater went when it left the factory? And I said, no. And they said, well, it went into the drinking water reservoir. I didn't believe that, but I checked the records, and sure enough, they were right. Um, so I, after that, I thought, you know, there's more than the Ministry of Health records, and now I also need the Ministry of Agriculture records. So I started looking in a new set of records, and I expanded my search from Kiev to um, the, down to the provinces and to Belarus and to Russia. Um, and in the Ministry of Agriculture records, I was looking for pathways of contamination. Um, and there, too, I found a whole host of records that shows that modern disasters basically need a modern state to clean them up. Um, and where this a accident took place was anything but a place that had a modern state. Um, this is the Pripyat Marshes, um, and Europe's largest swamp, and the Chernobyl areas right in here. And this territory is ecologically extremely beautiful and extremely complicated. There are 17 rivers that go through this bowl of sandy bowl of land. And as the rivers go through, it breaks up into hundreds of streams and lakes and bogs. Um, nuclear power reactors need a lot of water. Uh, they plan to have 10 uh, reactors here. It's going to be Europe's largest nuclear power plant complex. 
And so they put it right in the middle of this swamp. Um, the swamp is, here's just a picture of the swamp lands. The swamp floods a lot, and this is a, a, a map from 1939 that shows, you know, at the height of the flooding season in the, in the spring melt, just how much of this area just becomes water. And people who lived there traditionally had this mode where they just retreated, they, where they're used to being cut off most of the spring months, and they would retreat to canoes and, um, and you know, move their livestock around and had their houses on one little grassy home and their or a little knoll, and they'd have their barns on another, and they'd canoe between them. Um, this photograph is from 1965. It gives you a sense of, of the kinds of um, advancement or kinds of um, resources people were using. Most villages lacked plumbing and central heating. Um, villagers carried water from open wells to open buckets. Um, they, they, taking a bath and doing laundry involved a lot of work, so most people did those things quite rarely. Uh, heating came from burning peat and wood, which after the Chernobyl accident was contaminated. Dirt roads generated a lot of dust, which after Chernobyl was radioactive dust. Um, rural shops carried salt, kerosene, and little else. People mostly fed off you know, themselves um, as subsistence farmers. And everyone worked the fields. Um, men, women, children, pregnant women, um, the few hospitals that were there were understaffed. Um, basically much of the industrial age had passed this part of the world by until 1986 when it all came down in one big cloud. Um, radiation levels in, in southern Belarus, especially where the, those planes seeded the, the clouds, reached the same levels as that but right next to the plant. Um, now, the reason I call my book the, a manual for survival is I find a lot of instruction manuals in the, in the archives, and these are the kinds of instruction manuals that I don't think had ever been published any time in human history before. There are manuals about how to survive a nuclear accident, how to farm, how to pack meat, how to um, tan leather, you name it, there's a manual in there, a highly technical manual, instructing people how to get, get by, live off a radioactive landscape. Um, now, for farmers, for instance, the manual stipulated that collective farmers should become basically modern consumers of food and fuel and medicine while following the safety regulations for, designed for workers at nuclear power plants. Um, and measures focused usually on the village, and the village could be about two dozen to about several hundred homes. Um, and the homes are surrounded by vegetable patches and barns with big collective farm fields around them. And villages doubled as sites of food production. Farmers hauled hay to barns, herded animals from pastures to the village, gathered mushrooms and berries and wood in the forest and brought them into the village. Uh, they used ash and manure, manure, which is exceptional radioactive concentrants to um, fertilize their fields. Trucks, horse carts, and buses tracked um, into the village with dust and dirt on their wheels. They washed down vehicles right in the village that left large puddles. They um, um, fought flies, fed on manure, and floated into the kitchens, onto the food. Day by day, radioactive isotopes were drawn into the village, which is the center of the rural economic vortex. The, Households in these villages became the spleen where radioactive isotopes moored. And so the manuals were drawn up to help farmers deal with it. Um, farm workers were advised to dress like nuclear operators in jumpsuits, uh, respirators, hats, and gloves with personal uh, dose meters. Farm bosses who had neither um, radiation monitoring equipment nor training to understand how to run them, we're supposed to set up radiological monitoring stations in each village. Farmers were to shower after work. Um, they couldn't lie down in the grass, eat outdoors, or ride in open carts or trucks. They couldn't burn branches or leaves, uh, graze or livestock outdoor, or use local wood or peat. Better not to enter the forest at all, the manuals said. Um, to follow the survival manuals, the farmers were expected to, to give up the very means of survival that they had used for, for centuries to get by in this Pripyat marshes. 
Meanwhile, soldiers and workers took to cleaning the landscape. They dug up the topsoil and dumped it on the outskirts of town in temporary waste treatment areas, which is just a big hole in the ground. Um, to make up for the lost nutrients, they dumped lots of extra nitrogen fertilizers on the, on the um, crops. Hundreds of thousands of tons of extra chemical fertilizers went down. In abandoned fields, they had all kinds of problems with extra pests and rodents. So they um, massively seeded the fields with um, fertilizers, I'm sorry, pesticides, especially DDT, which was formally banned at the time. Uh, managers wrote up plans to build bathhouses so farmers could wash up after work. It took years to build those bathhouses. In the spring, ice dams clogged the territory as normal, added a lot of um, flooding. As the land flooded, the radioactive contaminants that had been buried sort of down in the soil recirculated again. And it especially flowed into the, the grassy banks where the farmers liked to have um, their cows and their horses graze. Um, crews came in to build dams to channel the flood water into holding ponds. Bulldozing and plowing fields kicked up a lot of dust. That dust went back into the villages on trucks and on the wind. Uh, on farm equipment, soldiers fought the dust with the green chemical foam that they sprayed on houses and barns and roads. They pulled down thatch roofs and instead put up corrugated iron roofs, which didn't insulate as well, but were easier to scrub down with a brush to get the radioactive contaminants off. They had plans, they drew plans to pave the playgrounds and, and the roads, to install central heating so people wouldn't have to use wood and peat. Villagers were told they had to give up their private plots and that they should shop in stores instead, but the problem was the stores didn't have any food in them. They didn't have any refrigerators to keep the food cool. The trucks and the carts that delivered food to these stores didn't have any refrigeration also, so the milk that came in often came in spoiled and dusty. It's often delivered on just open horse carts. Um, the, they set up new plans to serve kids three meals a day in school, new indoor gyms and pools so they didn't have to play outside in the forest and in the lakes and the ponds. This was basically a fast-tracked modernity. Belizeans in this area who for centuries had grown their own food through plague and famine, through war and drought, were suddenly to become modern consumers overnight. These, but this, unfortunately, as one can imagine, this new modern infrastructure took years if it was going to happen at all. Um, basically, the sleepy farm communities of, of southern Belarus and northern Ukraine hadn't kept up with the trend by the 1980s of industrializing agriculture, as we would see in the 1980s in America at the time, that farmers and Americans had switched to large landholding concerns that specialized in either meat or dairy or soybeans or hay. Um, those farms function basically like factories in the United States. Employees and agribusiness concerns didn't toil in the, in the dirt and in the fields. They ran tractors and other machinery that did the work for them. American farmers arrested livestock in big um, holding pens. Chickens were stacked in cages and chicken houses that grew to be the size of plane hangers. They led sows and steers into airless, dark barns for speedy fattening. Free-range animals were just something for hobby farms and to show um, petting zoos. So I can't tell when I'm looking at these instruction manuals whether they were serious about this fast-track modernity for these villages. Um, whether the authors knew that their schemes and their budgets were basically utopian. I admire the effort, the intellectual brain power, the dedication of billions of rubles to repair the mess. No state had ever tried on this scale before to clean up a nuclear accident at this level. The efforts were, for the most part, though, a failure. It didn't take many curies of radioactivity in the soil for it to show up in the food chains. And scientists had known this for years. In 1959, Howard Odom wrote, um, he was in, you know, an American, the great American ecologist, wrote, we could give nature an apparently innocuous amount of radioactivity and have, it, have her give it back to us in a lethal package. And that's because radioactivity is a very dynamic element that mimics biological um, organisms and minerals, and it concentrates, it, it biomagnifies 
in plants and animals and up the food chain to the bodies of humans. Six months after soldiers scrubbed down villages and scraped the right way topsoil, they had to come back and do it all over again. Dust and radioactive radioactivity migrated from surrounding forests and fields into villages, drawn like everything else into these humming regional centers of the economy. Soldiers returned to clean again three and four times, the constructs moving the radioactive isotopes from one spot to another, mounds of contaminated dirt and roofing material piled up, piled up on the outskirts of towns, 800 unmarked radioactive graves dotted the southern Belarusian landscape. In 1987 and 1988, radiologists added more communities to the list of contaminated populations to be strictly controlled, especially for food consumption. Belarusian officials calculated they could produce only a fifth of their usual quotas for meat and for dairy. They begged for more food for village shops to feed villagers. In 1987, a third of all milk and a fifth of all Meat in southern Belarus was too contaminated to use. Even cows pastured on decontaminated fields produced polluted milk. One reason was that farm managers kept in production highly contaminated fields because they had to meet their quotas. One agronomist wrote, they feed that radioactive hay to all sorts of animals, and those, animals, uh, those animal products are contaminated. They're planting fields right now in the zone of alienation, and as a result, they will again have contaminated feed. And again, they will have to figure out what to do with all that spoiled food products. They aren't even trying, he complained. That same official suggested resettling 12,000 more people. His letter was ignored. So forced to meet their production quotas, farm bosses had no choice but to send their workers out to contaminated fields to work and to produce contaminated food. The results were predictable. In Gomel and Mogila provinces in 1987, meat and milk were more radioactive than in 1986. Hotter again yet in 1988 than in 1987. It took only 15 curies per square kilometer for nearly all the milk to be above permissible levels. Levels in southern Belarus were between 40 and 140 curies a square kilometer. Mushrooms, meat, and wild boar came in, and fish came in even yet more radioactive. So I came across another survival ma manual that clued me into the trauma of this contaminated food. Soviet officials, of course, hated to throw out especially meat. Red meat was so valued in the late Soviet economy. And so they had this instruction manual that said, okay, you know, they slaughtered about 100,000 head of uh, livestock that were in these contaminated fields. And um, then they said, well, what are we going to do with all this? This, these carcasses, and they, they sent out an instruction manual that said to take the high-level meat and store it in a freezer and wait, wait for it to decay on its own. Take the medium and the low-level meat and mix it with clean meat and make sausage. And s label that sausage as you normally would, the instructions say, send it all over the country, <laughs> just not to Moscow. <laughs> better not Leningrad either. So quickly I see in Gomel, big meat packing plant in Gomel, I see that they're asking for more freezers because they have so much high level radioactive meat. They keep asking, they keep asking, which I assume means that they didn't get the freezers. So what they do is they find the, a, re, a refrigerated train car, the same refrigerated train car that revolutionized industrial agriculture, and they used it for a post-nuclear accident zone. They took the radioactive meat and they shoved it in the uh, train car and they sent it to Baku. In Baku, the Geiger counters went off, they sent it to Yerevan. And off this train car went for four years, this radioactive ghost train circulated the western half of the Soviet Union, nobody wanting it. Finally, in 1990, the KGB took the train and buried it in the Chernobyl zone as radioactive waste, where it should have probably gone in the first place. Um, now these measures to clean and reclean made little economic sense. It cost a million rubles to decontaminate as one square kilometer. Planners eventually spent millions more to build bathhouses, new clinics, schools, and kindergartens and laid down pavement and pipelines. Spending the money instead on just moving people out of this territory would have been a savings, not just in money, but in human anxiety and dignity and human health. 
Now, from 1986, I find that residents of these contaminated areas begged to be relocated. Um, a group of villagers wrote, and, and there are thousands of letters in the archive from villagers, from people in these contaminated territories. They wrote, there is no food in the stores, and we're not supposed to eat our own homegrown produce, yet we're banned from leaving. How are we supposed to live? Another group um, wrote from Gomel province, we don't want to stand with a string bag in front of the store and wait for a shipment of clean food. We are farmers, yet we can't feed ourselves. We want to be where we can live like human beings and see the fruits of our labor. Now the records show that these farmers were correct. As the people in the Chernobyl lands went about their lives, they slowly shifted location without ever moving. As they ate and breathed on Chernobyl contaminated landscapes, their biochemical composition changed. Pico puree by pico puree, they were slowly becoming part of reactor number four, the reactor that no longer existed. But now, relocating more than a million people in these contaminated lands was something that was politically impossible for Moscow to do. I mean, they discussed it in the meetings and, and they dismissed it out of hand. We, we can't do that. That would be basically too embarrassing to admit so, so that kind of defeat. You know, the Soviet um, polity was there to, to take science and engineering and make life better. And suddenly to take that same science and engineering and say, oh, we've destroyed a million people's lives was just impossible to do. Um, so in the mid-1990s, leaders in Belarus and Ukraine began to beg um, to move at least another 200,000 people from these, especially southern Belarus, but also areas of northern Ukraine. They didn't get any traction from Moscow. By 1990, Moscow was saying we're bankrupt. We don't have any more money for this Chernobyl accident. In fact, we'd like to close the chapter on this accident. And um, as the protests blew up, as the um, Soviet Union collapsed, I found that UN agencies started to take over managing the disaster. And um, international experts came in and did their own ex assessment. And I worked in about five UN archives, um, trying to follow this story. Like, why don't we know this story of a big public health disaster? Where did it go? And um, what I find is that these UN experts come in and they say, you know, we see a lot of health and medical problems in these areas, but nothing related to the Chernobyl contaminants. These people just smoke and they have poor diets and they're, and they, they're radiophobic. They're too anxious about their exposure. Um, and it causes stressful you know, situations to move people from one place to another, so better to leave them in place. And that has become the, the main narrative. If you find you, the same with after Fukushima, better leave people in place. Um, they're now planning for, you know, they're putting up planning manuals for the next big nuclear emergency, and the recommendations are to leave people in place. So this is, a, you know, the standard answer that we're going to see, too, in the future. And, and, and that, too, was a political decision. Um, and as I worked this story in the UN archives, and this is, a, a, I can give a whole other talk on this, um, I found that UN officials, aided by American officials from the Department of Energy, are working really hard to hide this story of a public health disaster occurring in the Chernobyl contaminated lands. They take evidence, they take you know, actual biopsies of kids with cancer from the Chernobyl territories. They, just, they don't believe it, so that's impossible, there can't be that many cancers so soon. They bring it home, these cancers check out in their labs, they, they disappear the evidence, they don't put it in their reports. Um, all these medical reports and, and studies come in from Ukraine and Belarus especially, um, they just cut them out, edit them out, and say these studies are, don't fit standard westernized protocols, they're not any good, and they toss them out. And they say this line over and over again, you know, that the doses are too low compared to the Hiroshima studies for anybody to have any kind of health effects that we can you know, determine. And that becomes the standard line that you'll still hear in the press today. What I found is that you know, I was asking myself, why are these UN agencies doing this? And it's, it's not the entire UN, it's just a few key officials at the International Atomic Energy Agency and the UN um, Committee for the, the Scientific Committee for the Effects of Atomic Radiation on this year. Um, and they're weighing down heavily on, on officials at the World Health Organization. Um, and I find that like 
the, the American officials are really nervous about Chernobyl, and in part because they have all these lawsuits coming over the pike. At the end of the Cold War, archives were open, all kinds of people learned that they had sat in a path of exposure from the reduction and testing of nuclear weapons in the United States. In fact, the United States is one of the few countries in the world to be brave enough to have the temerity to open up a, a nuclear test site in the continental US, Nevada. And all that radioactive fallout went north and then east. Um, Rochester was you know, a big site. We know that about that because of the Kodak plants up there had to change their process every time there was a big bomb going off in the back. Um, so what I find in 1987 in Columbia, Maryland, there was a big meeting of health physicists. These are people who, that's their specialty, is to work on uh, the physicists who work on health problems. And they have a meeting and a, a lawyer from the Department of Justice addresses the group and says, you know, the biggest threat to nuclear in America right now are not accidents, it's not, you know, the, it's not the costs, it's lawsuits. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have breakout sessions and Department of Justice lawyers met individually with these health physicists to train them how to become expert witnesses in court on behalf of the US government. They were serving as objective scientists, but well-trained to, to give certain kinds of answers. This is the kind of anxiety that we find at the end of the Cold War um, about the legacy of producing nuclear weapons. And the British had their problems and lawsuits, and the French also, um, as well as the Russians. So um, I show in my book how these US and, and UN officials colluded to minimize the effects of the Chernobyl um, disaster, especially in terms of health effects. Um, and they worked hard to make sure that there was no money allocated. There was a big UN um, pledge drive. No money allocated to move these additional people who needed to be moved and to do a long-term health study on the chronic effects of low doses of radioactivity. We don't have that study to this day, and uh, these people who did finally move had to move on their own dime. And so basically, um, about a million people were left to bare life, um, living in the contaminated zones, doing their best um, in a new neoliberal order. The responsibility the, um, for cleaning up and dealing with the disaster devolves from the state, you know, throws it off, the UN agencies, the international agencies toss it off, and it's left to these people alone to, to manage on their own. Um, in fact, I even find um, that UN programs start to begin to teach people how to farm in a post-nuclear order, how to feed your kids and, and filter your food so that your kids have less radioactivity when you prepare a meal. Um, they published new manuals to instruct um, post-Soviet leaders about how to talk to the public about nuclear accidents. You know, don't tell them everything's fine and then give a list of foods they can't eat. You know, they, they, these are the kind of instruction manuals that were published in Russian. Um, they gave lessons on cost-benefit analysis, which put a dollar value on human health and on human lives. Um, the higher the cost of the cleanup, the Western um, economists taught to save each additional life, the more money they would need. Did they have that kind of money? How much do you want to spend to spare 50 curies from somebody's diet? Now, when they had that meeting, the Belarusian officials said, you know, please can we have this classified? Because they, the, the fact that they were putting, that the Westerners were putting a value on human life in an actuarial sense was absolutely shocking. In the 1990s, the problem was um, no longer one for states or inter international agencies to handle, but really for these people on their own, these farmers, those least equipped to handle the emergency. Now, as they went, when the farmers didn't have the, the time or the money to filter their food and to make sure it was cleaned of radioactive isotopes, they were called nuclear fatalists. If they worried too much about their health problems because of their exposures, they were called radiophobic. Um, if they asked for help in dealing with this situation, they were called chronic welfare cases. There was no way they could sort of win in this situation. Um, and today there is still a public media campaign to normalize the Chernobyl zone um, as a place that's where the wildlife is thriving, as a place that's great for adventure tourism. And when a journalist is given, this is a BBC reporter, the job of, you know, by the editor, go out and get that thriving nature story in the Chernobyl zone, 
if in fact they can't see any big fauna. And I, as I worked this story, I, I've uh, served as a participant observer following two biologists who go twice a year to the zone. And I, I followed them around. And I, I never saw any big fauna. I live in Washington on Rock Creek Park, and I, I see a deer every month. Um, so anyways, if you can't get the shot, the, not to worry, there was a wolf in a cage in, in the little town of Chernobyl, and you can get your shot. Um, there's even, you know, there's, as I say, lots of tourism. Tourism has gone up 30% this year after the show. There's a, the, one of the main um, physicists who says that the Chernobyl zone is thriving. He just produced atomic vodka. He grew a, a field of rye inside the zone. And um, it came out, it had a lot of radioactive cesium in it, but he filtered it out and he got this uh, vodka that he claims, you can buy it for $100, he claims it's safe to drink. Um, but this, of course, I mean, there's lots of abandoned land, farmland in Ukraine. You don't need to use the Chernobyl zone for farmland. The only reason you would grow rye and produce atomic vodka there is if you want to make a political statement, if you want to normalize the zone. Um, now, in Manual for um, Survival, I characterize Chernobyl um, as not an exceptional event. And, and that's why I want to talk about this idea that Chernobyl, if you characterize it as an accident, you know, the world's worst nuclear accident, um, then it's this, something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But what I found as I worked is that um, in this territory, of, um, this is a swampland. This is a map I came across, and this map was produced in 1965. And this is a map of radioactive cesium in the Pripyat marshes. Now, these guys made this map who were specialists in nuclear emergencies, and for some reason they showed from between 1961 and 1964 in this swampland before the Chernobyl plant was even built. And they made this map. Chernobyl's right down here. The hot spot is right in here. And in this hot spot is also a Soviet Air Force bombing range. And I, I you know, have some evidence that they were testing small strategic nuclear weapons in this bombing range. Um, the Soviet censored publication said that this radioactive cesium came from global fallout from atomic testing. They said it was mostly American bombs that <laughs> dropped that, <laughs> that radioactive cesium. But my point is, is that swamp where the Chernobyl was later built was already radioactive before the plant was even built. That um, the villagers in these swamps and territories had 10 to 30 times more radioactive cesium in their bodies than, village, than city dwellers in Minsk and Kiev, already by 1965. I found when I was traveling around with the, with the biologists that um, when we went to the Red Forest, the part of the Chernobyl zone that took the hardest hit of radi radiation, there was, my Geiger counter was going crazy. I expected it to be like 50, 100 um, microsieverts an hour. I find it's 994, almost 1,000. And I asked the biologist, I'm like, what's going on? Why is it so hot here? And they said, oh yeah, we had a fire here eight months ago, and that took the, volatilized all the radioactivity that was stored in the leaf litter and in the, in the wood and recirculated again. Now this would have been, if, there was no press about it. There was nobody there to really catch this. But had there been, the International Atomic Energy Agency would have scored this a level five out of a level seven for nuclear accident emergencies. And I think that's part of the problem we have with long-lived radioactive isotopes and, and with chemicals that are nearly eternal, is that we don't have the attention span in human societies um, to care and to curate territories with these kinds of long-lasting toxins. Um, so what I think is, is, is a better way to characterize Chernobyl is not as an accident, but as a, as a point of acceleration on a timeline of exposures that began in 1945 and continue to this day. Um, and then we start to see Chernobyl a little bit different. Radioactive iodine, you take one isotope alone. Chernobyl issued 45 million curies of radioactive iodine. That's a terrific amount. Radioactive iodine goes to the thyroid, causes all kinds of health problems, including thyroid cancer, Hashimoto's disease. Um, but the Soviet American testing, just 1961 and 1962 alone, of nuclear weapons, issued 20 billion curies of radioactive iodine. Not 45 million, but 20 billion, whole order of magnitude higher. 
Um, and what you see when you start looking is that we've had a, a terrific rise in thyroid cancer. Uh, it's off the charts. It keeps going higher and higher. The, most cancers started growing around 1940, 1950, and leveled off around 1980, but, but thyroid cancer and liver cancer are still going strong. Um, childhood cancer used to be a medical rarity in the 1930s. Doctors would come running when there's a child that had leukemia. Now, of course, there's you know kids advertising chemo drugs and bald kids on the buses. Um, so this, and then the other troubling um, statistic that comes out is that in the northern hemisphere, where most of this radioactive fall landed, um, men since 1945, their sperm counts have dropped in half. Now these are, you know, correlations. Whether there is causation behind this is, I think. Some, a question we should not leave to scientists alone to answer because almost eight decades have passed and scientists haven't really addressed this question. Um, so let me just finish up with one last story. Um, I, you know, I do some ethnographic work um, as, I, as I go along. I was traveling a lot in the summer times in northern Ukraine and southern Belarus and I kept seeing all these berry pickers. Not just a few berry pickers, but thousands of them. And um, they would come out of the forest and they'd be met by these buyers who would have vans and they would buy the berries immediately from the pickers. And I asked the, the, you know, this woman who was buying, she said, hey, I buy about two tons a day. And there are a lot of vans. So uh, my research assistant and I, we decided to go undercover berry picking. And here I am, I'm happily selling my berries. Um, and then we followed the, the, the buyers to the warehouse where there was this nice lady who was wanding all the berries as they came in. And um, you know, I, I asked her, I was like, so you know, how many of these berries are radioactive? And she says, all the berries are radioactive. <laughs> but some are really radioactive, like 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. The norm, the <coughs> threshold at, in Ukraine at the time was 450 becquerels a kilogram. So 3,000 was a lot more. So we stood around and watched her buy berries, and um, I noticed that she was buying all the berries. The ones over the permissible limit and the ones under the permissible limit. So the, the cleaner ones went over there and the, and the dirtier ones went over there, but she bought them all. So I asked, like, why are you buying all the berries? What are you gonna do with the dirty ones? And I didn't get an answer from, from the nice lady, but the buyer, the pickers told me, they're like, well, it's like the sausage. They just mix them together. And then they get an average that you know meets the permissible norm, and then they can sell them across the border to Poland, where they enter the EU market. So now these berries, like you could say, oh yeah, channel something out there, you know. But now these berries get a little closer. You're thinking of your summer vacation. Um, but then I was just sniffing around, and I saw this document from Homeland Security, which talked about a a truck crossing the border from Canada into the U.S. and inside the truck was a radiating mass. And so I called the guy up who was on the dock and I said, what was in that truck? And he goes, oh, those were berries from Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> so now this story gets a little closer to our breakfast tables. Um, and, and I think that's you know, one of the things that you know, we forget when we think about these accidents is something that's a bummer for those people over there is that these, um, with our global markets, these contaminants are going, they're not only going in the trade winds, but they're also going in our great container ships all over the world. And so I hope you understand now why this, you know, these guys of course are liquidators, but why this young girl with the blue lips, who I photographed while I was berry picking, is also a nuclear cleanup worker. She's there to take care of the detritus left to her by other people. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think once we start to recognize this problem, if we face this problem not with denials, not with you know sort of covering up or pushing it aside, but with our eyes wide open, then humans are incredibly creative and innovative, and we can come up with solutions to these problems. Um, you could think of these berries in terms of um, bioengineering. You know, all those chemicals and bulldozers could not get this territory clean but the berries and then the later the cranberries that come back to pick in August and the mushrooms they pick in the fall are doing a fantastic job cleaning up the environment. And so we could take these berries and send them out to our breakfast tables. We could also take these berries, pay this girl $25 a day to pick them, which is a good wage in her economy, 
and then deposit them as radioactive waste as they should be deposited. And we could do that with other products too. And we could maybe even talk the, the disaster tourists into spending money to go pick berries, <coughs> radioactive berries. And then they could take a selfie of themselves eating a radioactive <laughs> berry, and then they could deposit it as radioactive waste. And she could get her $25 a day. Uh, I, I guess I'm just trying to say that you know once we start to face these problems and look at them as problems, we can start to come up with solutions. And the solutions might actually be much better than the other options. So thank you. We have the easy, easy time for questions and uh, enable speakers, so I'll let her go. Tony Nemity from the New School. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm a giant fan of your Chernobyl book. Um, and um, one of the issues that you talk about very, very briefly in that book, which to me was totally fascinating also, was um, sort of thinking about the comparison between the way the Soviets responded to this um, and the way the Japanese responded to Fukushima. And I'm just wondering if you would care to speak a little bit about, uh, about that comparison. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you keep seeing after the, the commentary after the HBO series on Chernobyl was, well, this is a Soviet problem. This, you know, this could only happen in the Soviet Union because they were so mendacious and so incompetent. But I actually think that um, the, the Japanese didn't even come anywhere close to trying to do it um, in, in the way that the Soviets did. I think they did the best job that, that anyone has yet managed to do, and even so, it became an intractable situation. So, you know, you think of, um, you know, the big charge is, oh, the Soviets waited three days to tell the world. You know, it takes a while to figure out what exactly is happening in the burning nuclear power plant that you can't really approach safely. Um, the Japanese, in comparison, waited two months to tell the world that they had three reactors that had melted down. Um, the Japanese evacuated a number of people, but then quickly wanted to move them back. And the Soviets also wanted to move people back. Um, but they got talked out of it by their local scientists who were like, this, you know, this is something that's just not going to happen. So in Belarus, which was more compliant, about um, 12 villages were repopulated, which then, you know, a couple of years later had to be depopulated yet again. Um, but otherwise, they, you know, they, they kept, they were willing to have this large sacrifice zone and then have an expanding sacrifice zone that was, you know, politically painful, uh, economically costly, but they did it to keep people safe. So, um, you know, now, you know, they, they did produce all these waste storage dumps. You know, in Japan, we, they have the famous garbage bags, you know, pyramids of garbage bags that now just got washed in the tsunami and are floating all over, not the tsunami, but the typhoon that just occurred uh, a couple weeks ago. So um, I, I don't think the Japanese score very well compared to the Soviets. Mm -hmm. What about the US? Like places like Rocky Flats, where they used to you know, produce the... Yeah, the US has a great, the Department of Energy has this program in which they take these radioactive brownfields and you know, clean them up, you know, they get rid of the buildings, they bury things, and then they say, look, wildlife preserve. And I have a couple of brochures that I've, I've made, you know, my own, in my own disaster tourist circus. Uh, circus. <laughs> I, I picked up the brochures from these places, and they're really interesting brochures. They're like, welcome to this nature preserve. Um, just a few rules. Uh, stay on the gravel path. Uh, no dogs. Um, nobody can touch that water in that pond. And if you see any piece of brick or mortar that looks like this, this, or this, don't touch it. Um, but enjoy the. <laughs> enjoy the <nature. laughs> and so you know the Hanford. Hanford has uh, you know the last free flowing stretch of the Columbia River. Rocky Flats has all these native plants. You know they're saved, brought to you by the U.S. military because this this territory wasn't suburbanized. Um, but some reporters just contacted me the other day, and they're finding you know, they're building a new stretch of highway through that Rocky Flats territory, and as they're you know, dredging up dust, they're finding all these little plutonium fragments. A little tiny bit of plutonium dust in your lung is bad. It, you know, it's very hard to get rid of. Uh, it just decays there powerfully, and often causes lung cancer and, and respiratory damage. Um, so, yeah, the US record is not, you know, so when people say, oh, this, you know, Chernobyl could never happen in the United States, my retort is it's already occurred. You know, a Hanford has emit, emitted 350 million curies of radioactivity right into the environment, not as an, an accident, but as part of the operating order, you know, sort of the disaster by design. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any ideas about influencing the uh, Russian government on their plan to have floating nuclear power plants in the Arctic Circle? <laughs> yeah. Numerous. Yeah. No, I don't, unfortunately. I don't know how one would influence the Russian government to... I've seen those. There's a city right there in St. Petersburg, the floating reactors. It's right in the harbor. Wow. I don't know if it's plugged in, but it was sitting there a couple of years ago. It's a big plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of us are not as exemplary as Tony and haven't read the Chernobyl book yet, so maybe this is already part of it. But manual is in the title of the book, and I wanted to ask about manuals because, um, you know, in a nice turn of phrase, someone once remarked that the Soviet Union was a hyper textual state, not in the internet sense, but in the sense of it's just constant prolixity, right? It was this empire of words that. Socialism had to be explained, and then explained again, and explained again, and we had all these moral codex of the Soviet citizen. And not exactly a handbook, but a, you know. And so I just wondered, you know, without, without, you know, uh, trying to say everything's fine, right? I was. You did say at the beginning that these were these were manuals that had never really been seen before, and I get that in the context of the nuclear thing. But I, I guess I'm wondering, perhaps in another com comparative kind of question. To me, it seems so organic that, this, that a late Soviet state and even a post-Soviet state would produce, would be very forthcoming about explaining, 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 and distributing manuals, even if it's not a very modern state. They were very good at distributing texts to rural areas. And, and it was this distinctive of this world area for having done this? Because I, I really struggled to picture after Three Mile Island or something that, that, the, you know, that our government rushed to rush to provide manuals for people. I mean, did Japan do this? Do, like, is this a Soviet thing, or does everyone kind of do you this? Know, I haven't not? seen anything of this sort, like how to farm right. after Three Mile Island. Um, I've never seen anything of the kind. And I can't imagine the US government doing it, because then you'd have to admit right. there's well, a problem. No. Right. Yeah. You know, these manuals are all classified. You know, they were for the managers to read, and then transmit these recipes, these formulas, to the, to the farmers. And th they're so incredibly yeah. complicated. Okay. You know, they were written by people who worked in, um, you know, sort of closed military establishments in Moscow and Russia, and they, um, are, you know, they live these sort of, you know, post post uh, you know post box lives, right? So they, they're they're not very good communicators. So they're kind of hysterical to read because you're like, what farmer, you know, with less than a high school education could understand these these long um, algorithms? <laughs> You know, some of the math problems go on for pages. And this is how they were supposed to, you know, the, the formulas to filter the milk and the formulas for how much, um, you know, sort of chemicals you put in to clean out this and that. I mean, it's just amazing. And so I think that the American government would never have done this. I've never seen it like around the Department of Energy sites um, because it means you have to admit you have this major problem. Mm -hmm. um, I was like nodding my head like endlessly while you mentioned how short our attention span there is like when such traumatic um, accident happened that actually takes like much longer time than the imagined time to like clean up and so i think especially for people that lived in communities that are not necessarily like geographically close to such area or like generations that came later like myself you know, um, we learn these things through narratives, like secondary, tertiary, and like media portrayed. So, I wonder, like, whether you think there's sort of like a moral plot, like bottom line for media or any kind of storytellers in any format, whenever things are being talked about, like for accidents like this, like what sh what kind of moral responsibility should they? Take moral care? responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think. I, I, for a while, I, I worked in media myself, and editors are always looking for a new spin on an old story. If you have an old story, it's it's not a story. It's not newsworthy. So if you're going to do an old story, it needs a new spin. So, okay, Chernobyl, 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 we've heard about how dirty and contaminated awful it is. We need a new story, and the new story is like, oh, it's actually fine. You can produce vodka there, or, you know, there's all kinds of wild horses running around. And so that, like... That instinct to, you know, that not instinct, but the imperative to sort of sell, sell more advertising space and attract, um, you know, consumers to your media, 
means that you're going to tell all kinds of different stories that you know have um, different levels of sort of truth claims behind it. Um, but that you know, in terms of morality, um, I mean, obviously that's a problem. But I don't think people are thinking in terms of morality. I think they're thinking in terms of you know, for the media, what you know, how are they going to sell more of their whatever their medium is? How many hits do you get? Yeah. I don't have a question about the you know the proposed solution, which I know is sort of speculative, but I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Because you know, you start the talk off talking about the water. You know, the water will clean it and then it'll go away, right. but of course it floats. Right. Um, and you know, the thing about my own context, like I live in Canada, so most of our disasters are from natural resource extraction. So like in the giant mine, uh, Diné territory in Yukon, they have these tailing ponds, it's an abandoned mine, they have these tailing ponds. To contain it, they're freezing the tailings in perpetuity. Whoa. So that requires like a very specific and high maintenance infrastructure energy, energy rich and forever. Mm -hmm. And it kind of relates to the storytelling because the Diné who lived there, of course, transmit that those stories to remember because it's buried or and that's how they're planning to remember in perpetuity that it's there but anyway so i, I just want like what are the is there anything you can say about the practicality i mean it's a speculative vision but it's the, it's well okay so the the, the the real offending you know the prevalent and offending isotopes are you know, cesium and strontium they'll be around for about 120 to 300 years i mean it's manageable okay. mm -hmm. yeah Right, you know, like if, yeah, I think we could try to remember for 300 years not to eat those berries, right. um, and better yet, I mean, to I mean, like really to pick the berries and deposit them someplace where it's not well, like it's, it's not, so not yeah, so it's not be becomes part of the leaf litter, you know, that's or eaten by an animal becomes part of manure that you know that then just volatilizes and, and circulates again, right? Cause if you just let the berries fall, um, first of all, people, local people, will not let them fall. They're just <coughs> They just can't. They just can't. Berries are so important. Mushrooms are so considered so important. But if you could, if you, if if there was a, you know, way to sort of get rid of them, um, buy them, you know, value them as locals want to value them, and I think that's important because they see them as a value, and then put them in a place where they won't recirculate. Then I think you could clean up that place conceivably. Um, as it is, you know, they're pretty far from so the Chernobyl site, but. Uh, 250 kilometers away in northern Rigny territory or province, there's been one study, one small study. There, is, there are not many medical studies. You would think in the Chernobyl zone there would be just hundreds of researchers and scientists, and there haven't been. But there's this one guy who's been doing with his team a study of um, birth defects, and he finds a, a six times elevation of birth defects in people who live in those swampy areas 200 kilometers away. Um, in part because of these, you know, sort of these natural products that people are eating, and he finds a corresponding elevated level of cesium in their bodies. So it would make a difference, you know, for locals. Mm -hmm. I have two comments. Uh, I was really struck, and it really resonated uh, with my research on um, uh, the Baltics and how Chernobyl kind of never stops. The temporality of Chernobyl never stops, considering the life uh, cycle of, of these radioactive particles and um, and that's exactly the experience even now people go to the market and when they buy, buy berries they are trying to figure out are they from in Ukraine or Belarus right. Right? so it's a very strong kind of continuity um, the second point is more about um, the lack of studies and um, I wonder to what extent the private fa uh, sector actually does make these studies. I was recently denied health insurance, life insurance uh, for entirely minor thyroid issue, which then had to provide a lot of kind of documentation from my doctor to just say that it's fine. But the argument was that I'm from the region. Oh, so therefore you're going to have so thyroid the cancer. Insurance companies yeah. actually clearly. Are very um, so they're studying it. They are studying, mm -hmm. so that's that's what's kind well, of that's interesting. personal yeah. touch on the <laughs> yeah. So there is the public, you know, pr pronouncement of risk, and then there's the actuarial pronouncement, which is much more dire. And those are the records we're not seeing. Exactly, it's proprietary knowledge, which is kind of very strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we won't get access to that. Yeah. yeah. You've emphasized that the responsibility 
devolves onto ordinary farmers and, and people. So I'm just wondering how this is expressed in, in daily life, in conversation, but also in, in attempts to measure it. Does, some, does somebody in a village have a Geiger counter that gets passed around and the information shared? Are there networks for ordinary people to deal with this Yeah, problem? not enough. You know, so, so one of the UN programs was to, you know, to get people to be sort of aware of the radioactive isotopes in the food chain and, and teach them how to farm in, in ways that would be more clean. It, it turned out to be just too expensive for these farmers to do and, and too complicated. Another program that was more um, sort of homegrown but, but came with some Western funding in Belarus was to um, provide Geiger counters. And Belarus started making Geiger counters in 1990, and now they have some of the best in the world. Um, and then provide them to schools, and then the teachers were trained in, in sort of basic physics and then the teachers and the students made maps of their local communities. Mm -hmm. So the kids would say to the parents, oh no, don't pick berries over in that part of the forest, mom. Pick them over there. <laughs> and so they would map out their communities and, and know where things were. And that, um, I think that's actually a good, you know, a good thing to do. Like again, eyes wide open kind of solution. Um, the, the funding for that has, again, we don't have the attention span, so the funding for that has, has um, fallen. And so I visited the, the last school with the last program. But that would be, you know, a great way so that people knew um, and could be, you know, could be aware of what, where they're going, that even where they're spending time, where they're going to have a picnic, it, it, it matters, you know, because there are spots. And as I worked with the um, biologists, I learned, and that was one of my goals, was to learn how to read the uh, terrain like you would an archive. And so, because I was seeing in the archives, you know, a big debate going on, and, and some people were saying, oh, there's a public health disaster occurring, and other people were, were saying, no, that's, that's not what's happening at all, there's other things going on. And so I, I wanted to cross-check the archives, and I, and I thought to myself, you know, people lie, and, and you know, the archives lie, but maybe trees don't lie. Um, and so I, I did learn, and I, and I, you know, there's all these um, mutations, and maybe I have one here. Um, you can see, like for instance, this is in that bombing range, the former bombing range. You see a, a, this bomb crater here. Um, and it doesn't really come off well, but this is a bomb crater. And from this crater, we're growing these pines. And this again is like two or three hundred kilometers from um, the Chernobyl accident site. But I noticed this little pine needle. And pine needles are programmed to grow straight out from the branch. And, you know, and, and so this is a mutation. And, and, and it was all kind of messed up, right? And so biologists would call this, a, a, you know, the, this, this, this pine needle has become disorderly, disorganized. Um, so when you start to see things like that, you can sort of clue in, oh, I should maybe pull out my Geiger counter here, and I should remember not to pick uh, mushrooms here. Sometimes you would see a whole um, side of a forest along a village which would have these huge sort of mutations, um, maybe I can find one, of these really ugly trees, like this kind of tree. This is a whole tree that's doing what that one pine needle is doing. These pines were planted to grow board straight for lumber. So when they're doing this, you know there's a problem. And so th just this kind of education could be you know, really helpful. Um, people didn't tend to have much of a sense of that, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, they were very good about sort of like understanding what was going on with their bodies. Um, and I had this habit of picking up hitchhikers um, at the bus stops because the bus service was poor. And I picked up women and children and everybody I picked up, this is just anecdotal so it, it didn't appear in my book, but everybody I picked up was going to or from medical care. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a lot of, so what we see when, we, when there's this focus on cancers and death tolls is um, you know, these acute effects. And, and that's really what we tend to care about when we talk about environmental toxins, the acute effects. How many people die? But it's the subacute effects. It's the thyroid cancer that you can't get life insurance for, or the thyroid, small thyroid problem that causes um, you know, your life to, you, know, you spend more time and money um, at medical clinics, and you're, you're less a, a able to get an education and good employment, and life just slows down. That, that's the real problem, I think, that you know, we would want to avoid having happen in our own communities. Yeah. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Can you say a little bit more, maybe, about how the things you learned when you were researching and writing the first book, Biography of No Place, how they shaped your understanding of um, 
of what you're working on now, with your novel, how those two things are related or not. Yeah, well, I knew, you know, um, I knew the specific, of course, sort of historical and ethnographic background of this territory called Polesia, you know, these, these sort of forest people. Um, I had better understanding, uh, better chance trying to understand Polishchuk, which is this hybrid of, of Polish and Ukrainian and Belarusian. And, um, and I, it, it was funny, I, I write about this in, in Manual for Survival, is that when I was you know, running around the 1990s um, doing that research on my, my first book, I heard a lot about Chernobyl. I was you know, living in Zhitomir, and, um, but I ignored it. I remember thinking, you know, like, oh, they just go, they're such whiners, they're going on and on about this one problem. Um, and then I started to revisit my own memories and my journals and, um, and to see that this problem was all around me. And it was something I was so easily sort of sh shunted aside. Um, obviously, like many people did, at the you know, like international experts did, and um, that my attitude at the time was, um, that of a dismissive Westerner that you know doesn't think that these people are very reliable sources. Mm -hmm. It's almost shameful to think about now. Oh yes. There was a, an accident in Siberia recently, mm -hmm. um, and it's been labeled Putin's Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any insight on what happened there and um, the similar effects and approach by the Russian government, blackouts in, in Moscow television and, and so on. It yeah. seems like there's a lot of secrecy and, and not a lot of um, facts coming out of that. Yeah, and I think in part the secrecy, it, it seems like it wasn't such a big, you know, it wasn't anywhere near the kind of spill that Chernobyl was. Um, and that the secrecy is in large part because it was a, a military weapon they were testing and it, and it didn't go well and, and that doesn't look good if you're trying to promote an image of a of a you know powerful um, state that has advanced technology that's going to use for offensive weapons. So I think that's really what more of the secrecy is about. Um, so I don't really think it's Putin's Chernobyl. I think that's an exaggeration. Yes. Um, Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Wonderful. Um, have any medical studies studies been done of the East European countries? I don't know if I ever told you, maybe when we met before, I had a friend from Bulgaria whose wife recovered from breast cancer and after Chernobyl, the, the breast cancer went crazy mm -hmm. and she ultimately died. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder, have any, has, has there been any collection of... Yeah, there's been some small studies, like I've seen some small studies in Bulgaria, others in southern Germany that were hit by around you know, the, around the Alps. Um, the problem with all, you know, there, you can, and I do at the end of the book sort of gather all these studies and discuss them, but they're all small. Mm -hmm. And until we have one big study, you know, like something on the lines of the atomic bomb survivor studies, you know, 300,000 people, then nobody's, that's not conclusive evidence. You know, right. if you have, you know, a, a results that are significant, but it's only 100 <coughs> people in the study or 20 people with significant effects, then it's just not, it's not it could be something else. So that is the problem. Yeah, there are studies, um, and they usually show bad news. Um, and you can put them all together, and they start to make a puzzle. Um, but it, you know, it's the epidemiologists want a really big study to, to show. And one of the things I've been advocating for, and in fact, in a couple of weeks I'll go to uh, and speak to a group of microbiologists, is that if we had biomarkers. Um, you know, with all of our vaulting um, breakthroughs in, in, in biology and medicine, um, just a way to, you know, because you, what you do now when you get a dose <coughs> estimate is it's, they take the ambient levels of radioactivity, they ask you what you ate 40 years ago or 10 years ago, how much time you spent outside, and then they calculate your, your, your estimated dose, and then with that estimated dose, they extrapolate against the Hiroshima numbers and give you a probability in the future of your, of your extra chance of getting these extra cancers, these cancers, this list of cancers. You have a 0.05 chance of getting thyroid cancer and 0.01 of leukemia, et cetera. So it's not, people are like, but what about, I, I don't feel well. My, my digestive tract is, is crazy and my, I have uh, those respiratory infections that I can't get rid of and I have these autoimmune problems. And what those dose projections now do is really just talk about future. And it's kind of almost a way of, these probabilities are a way of colonizing the future. 
to make you feel better or to make you feel something, but they, they never tell people how they feel now in real time. And all, you know, if we could get biomarkers, you know, incredible um, uh, information we get out of the, the microbiome, we got it, we've got bacteria, um, chromosomal changes in, in blood, uh, epigenetic changes and, and cellular intercommunication. These kinds of things could, if we had the will, could tell us immediately what you have in, you know, what kind of sign of damage you have individually right now. That might give us more clues to these subacute effects that, you know, a lot of scientists dismiss because you're not dead, right. but are but make life pretty miserable if you have, you know, five different chronic diseases going in, your kid has three others and your parents have another set. Yeah. Um, I have a more specific question about your archival experience uh, and the differences between um, all these archives and um, the Because I, I like this part of the a lot, how you travel between that. So I was like precisely thinking uh, about the difference between Belarusian, Belarusian and Ukrainian archives, especially that in Ukraine, like very fast, like after the accident, the accident actually became like nationally famed. It was like this important, you know, mobilizing factor for Ukrainian and Absolutely. You know, national edits, which I don't think that really happened in, in Belarus. And then I was thinking that actually even now we tend to think about the Chernobyl accident as a Ukrainian case, right? And, and I think that only with the publication of Svetlana Alexeyevich, actually people started to think oh, yeah, about Chernobyl in, in terms of Belarus. So I was like thinking whether all this kind of external um, external um, politics around it kind of affects the place or the ways, you know, the event is discussed in the archives, or you know, the way it's, it's silenced in the archives, or it's cover up, or maybe you know, the production of the, of the documents involved in the... Yeah, the well I read about that, that you know, the Ukrainians really did um, push Moscow to, to take more precautionary measures, and, and really made a case, and, and were successful in doing that. Um, where on the other side of the border in Belarus, they were told to inspect you know, the populations that were exposed, and they were told to carry out these medical procedures, and they just did it in the most cursory way. And, and, and the archives are almost funny that way. We're like, you know, we looked at um, a thousand people in this village, and we saw, you know, no demographic changes and no changes in health. That would be the, you know, the abstract at the top. And then you'd look at the document, and you'd see these huge demographic changes and these huge changes in health. That, that you know, they were pretending didn't all this evidence down below didn't exist. Um, and I think what was happening in Belarus, I can tell. This is the answer I got in interviews, at least, is they were like, well, we thought at first that Chernobyl happened in Ukraine, it was a Ukrainian problem. And we didn't really think it concerned us. Um, except there was one guy, uh, Alexander Sterenko, and, and he, he was a physicist, he was Belarus's you know, leading physicist, and he went down with the team, and they started measuring, and he got extremely alarmed. And he tried to make a case, the Belarusian leadership, like we have to do something, we have to get people out of there, we have to get clean food in there, you know. And um, he was just, it, they basically brought him up on trial and, and tried to um, you know, find him. They accused him of having uh, engaging in corruption, and he lost his job. A long, horrible kind of um, in, inter-institution uh, trial took place, persecuting him. Um, they, there was attempts on his life. I mean, it was a real nasty affair. But what I think Nesterenko did um, behind the scenes is he got the Belarusian Academy of Sciences to quietly start a series of studies. And they did these really impressive case control studies looking at um, levels of um, anemia, severe anemia, leukemia, you know, birth defects, et cetera. You know, look, taking the VTFs relatively clean and the, you know, the, 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 for a control and then looking at these contaminated lands. And when I came across that body of evidence, that's when I was finally convinced that there really was something to this you know, public health disaster that the Bill Russians proclaimed in 1990. And it was part because of that research. And, and I don't think the people in the Ministry of Health who were doing this sort of you know, fake, you know, cursory um, medical exams, I don't think they had any idea what was going on in the Academy of Sciences. Um, and I only happened to get into that archive because I knew somebody who sort of let me in on the sly. Um, but so that's what I think happened. It, it had to do with personality and politics and, and, and sort of the optics of, of, of the event. Just yeah, just following up on your question. The question. So, did, but did these um, uh, this, these tensions and uh, information, openness and gathering, did 
did that change after 91? One way or another, you didn't actually give us a chronology of... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in 1990, um, mm -hmm. the, especially the Belarusian um, diplomats, they, they had a seat in the UN that was one of the Soviet yeah. nations. So they started engaging in their own foreign policy. They went right to the... Um, I can't remember the name of who was the head of the UN at the time, but they went and said, you know, we, we, we are in dire straits, we need big help. And then you, the Ukrainian heard about that, and the Ukrainian diplomats showed up in New York too to, to make requests. And so then the UN um, General Assembly started a pledge drive, and they, they got this ad hoc Chernobyl committee run by a British diplomat, and um, they gathered all this evidence to make a case to raise a uh, billion dollars in today's money to do two things. That was to move people from these Chernobyl contaminated lands and to um, spend about half of that billion dollars on a long-term um, epidemiological study on you know, these chronic effects of Chernobyl contaminants. And it was at that point that the UN went in, the International Atomic Energy Agency in the lead did their own assessment so we don't see any, we see lots of health problems in this territory, but nothing attributed to Chernobyl. They had biopsies of kids with cancers in their hands. They, that, that does not go in the report. I called the guy who wrote the report. And I said, what happened to those biopsies? He said, what biopsies? And then I find it in the transcripts, and I you know, we, we talked about it, and he's like, oh yeah. It says here, I, I, I checked these bi I brought these biopsies home, and they checked out. And I said, so what, ha you know, why aren't they in your report? And, and then he blurted out, it was a mistake. Oh. But he had told me, uh, you know, before when he was still a scientist with integrity in his mind, he had told me that he had tried to put, you know, future predictions of thyroid cancer in his report, and, and Vienna kept taking it out, and he kept trying to put it in. And so there, you know, there's all this, um, as they say, you know, kind of a, I don't want to call it a cover-up, but, you know, a, a, a major diminishing of the impact of effects. So once the IEA says that, no, no charitable health effects, and there's not going to be any in the future, then that pledge drive failed mm -hmm. miserably. They, they raised less than a million dollars. And that's why we don't have the study today, and that's why those people languished in those really hot territories for another 10 years. It's criminal. Um, we read some of your uh, biography of No Place in class, and you were talking about how, um, like, early on the Soviets tried um, forming like national identities in the satellite states and then how that came back to, to bite them at a certain point. Um, is there like an identity of people radiated by Chernobyl? Is mm -hmm. that something that has formed or would it be similar to the Soviets? Yes, for sure. Um, I mean, they don't really have a word for it like you find you know, in for the people who survived the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, but they have this sense that, you know, uh, you know, would you like these, you know, blueberry dumplings? And you sort of look at them, and they're like, I know you don't want them. You know, they, you know, there's this, and this one woman, um, and I have this scene in this in, in the book. You know, she was like, you know, you guys come here from the west, and you're like Chernobyl, Chernobyl, Chernobyl. All you want to know about is Chernobyl, but we don't have Chernobyl here. But then, and like, she switches registers, and she quickly starts telling me about the two of us about the fact that she had um, two women's cancers and a heart attack at the age of 45. And we just kind of look at her, my research assistant and I, and then she goes, okay, well, well maybe we have Chernobyl here, but, it, but it's our Chernobyl. <laughs> and, and I think what she was trying to say is we don't want outsiders to come and stigmatize us and to characterize us. That, you know, we've had this tragedy and we want to be able to be the ones who, who name it and characterize it um, and without the stigma attached. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, play, it's a very defeated place. It, it's, it's quite sad. I mean, the people who, who've been able to move have left, and the people who are there are the people who have the, the least mobility, the, least, the, the fewest options to go. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's grim, it's grim. One last question. Sort of an anthropological philosophy lately. Do you find um, that ideas of cleanness and uncleanness have been affected at all by these experiences? I mean, you use the word hot. Um, you know, are they using concepts like chista de chista or what? Yeah, they, were this, they didn't use the word um, chisti, you know, chisti. 
food, right? But it's funny, in the Ukrainian documents especially, it's always in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. And I think that means, like, we're trying to get clean food, but we know it's going to be right. contaminated to some degree. Mm -hmm. Because, it, you know, the, the clean food was um, food that fell within a permissible limit, but, but there's still, you know, it's like that 450 Beck rolls. There's still 450 Beck rolls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's below the limit. So that, so that everybody understands that clean is only partially clean. It's acceptably clean, I guess, but it's still dirty. Mm -hmm. Everything's dirty. They know everything's dirty. Mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking the next one.